today we're going to be going over uh, some molecular structures uh, related to Keytruda and some of the uh, similar uh, protein structures there as well. Shida, do you want to give an intro about our structures here? Yeah, fantastic. So today we're going to be talking about antibodies in Nanome. And um, in particular, I'm going to be comparing Keytruda, which is also known as pembrolizumab. And here we've got already loaded into our into our system uh, Keytruda. And what we have in front of us really is a domain from PD-1 and the fab of Keytruda. So the fab is effectively just a functional unit, uh, if you want, or, or the fragment antigen binding unit of Keytruda. About five years ago or so, there was a big revolution in the way we use antibodies or anything for attacking cancer cells. Keytruda, the one which is which we're going to be discussing today, and its baby sister, if you want to call it, Obdivio, or also called Nivelumab, are the first antibodies that were generated in particular to target not necessarily the cancer itself, but to target PD-1, which is the program cell death protein 1, which plays a really important um, function in inhibiting immune responses within the body. So instead so of how just do they attacking work? the cancer directly and trying to kill the cancer, we're using the um, you know, thing that would kill the yeah. cell in order to, to trigger that to kill yeah. the cancer. Yeah. So effectively, what we're doing is we're using the host immune system itself to attack the cancer. But the way we're doing it is we're inhibiting the processes that dampen the immune system. And this protein called PD-1, and this is just a fragment of PD-1, or the extracellular domain of PD-1, uh, can be in, can be bound by an antibody in such a way that it it blocks the check one pathway. That means that the the immune system is not dampened, and it has yep. it has become a big way of modulating cancer cells. Instead of directly inhibiting the cancer, you actually use the immune system of the body itself to fight mm -hmm. the cancer cells. So today we're going to show you the structure of Keytruda. We're going to navigate uh, the structure of Keytruda within Nanom. We've got new tools here at Nanom now, which allow us to automatically annotate the antibody. What do I mean by that? Well, let's just illustrate what I mean by that. So in our, in our, in our plugins here, we've now developed <clears throat> a way for us to not only just visualize the proteins as proteins, as you can see here. We've, we've, we've managed to encode a way of, of us to look at the representation of the antibody so that anybody who's an, uh, an antibody engineer, en engineer can immediately recognize that this is an antibody. The first thing that, it, that the system asks me is, hey, you want to annotate this antibody. How do you want to annotate it? So there are various ways of annotating the antibody i.e. numbering the antibody using traditional methods, using methods that other people have got in the body. You could use IMGT. Those people who are in, in the antibody field would know that this is much more structural-based way of recognizing uh, the paratops of an antibody. We could also use things like Kabat or Choptria. So if you're working with any one of these annotation systems, if you, if you bring your antibody into Nanome, you immediately... Uh, be able to recognize your CDR regions, which are uh, the ones that are involved in binding to your antigen, that is the paratop. Let me just run the Kabat here for, for this particular antibody, which is in our space. But yeah, it went through, uh, what we've, yeah, have we've the got. different CDR loops all colored in different colors. Fantastic. So what we've got, if you look at this particular menu here, I'm just going to close this menu so that they're not in the way. If you look at this menu here, you will see that the antibody <clears throat> has now been annotated. What have we done? Well, we've annotated the, the light chain, which is the K, uh, labeled as K here. The heavy chain, which is H, record, recorded as H. And if we go closer to the antibody itself, as you can see here, you will see that it's also annotated the bits of the antibody that are involved in antigen binding. So in this case, on the, on the heavy chain, you've got CDR3 of the heavy chain, you've got CDR1 of the heavy chain, and you've got CDR2 of the heavy chain, all annotated. 
And you can see that this antibody really uses the CDR3 of the heavy mm -hmm. chain to do most of the work. If you imagine that this is our antigen here, so automatically it's already started showing you that, hey, this is the area of the antibody that we can use for exploring this particular area. And what we've got here is Keytruda's regions. Well, this guy here is a subdomain of PD-1. Let's see if we can put a surface here so we can see the interaction residues between our CDRs. As you can see here, these are the residues that are in direct contact. So this tryptophan here is in direct contact with our antibody. And you can see that this heavy chain, you can yeah, see yeah. here that you can see here that our, our paratops are actually interacting via the heavy chain three in purple. And then most of the uh, contribution also comes from the light chain from CDR1 on the light chain. And so here you go, you've got the interaction between PD-1 and your aunt, uh, and uh, Keytruda. So using just the simple tools that we've got in Nanome, we can use the sequence visualization. We can highlight the CDR sequences. We can understand where the paratops are and how which bits of the paratops of this uh, fab are responsible for binding to our epitope. And our epitope can be clearly visualized. So for instance, in the future, if I was gonna do a fast follower, uh, Keytruda, and I was so minded to do, I might design CDR sequences this purple here that better interact with my protein. Look at its epitope and then compare it with uh, Obdivio, which was uh, maybe about two years or a year behind in terms of in, 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 ter in terms of FDA approval and compare the two antibodies and then see the differences between their paratops and where they interact. So I'm going to bring in the other antibody. We've got two antibodies that recognize the same protein, but clearly they are recognizing it, recognizing it in different ways. You can see the CDRs are different. The place or the epitope where they bind is different. Automatically, we can now start thinking, you know, what's the differences between these antibodies? Well, what we could do is maybe align these two antibodies together remove the antigen and see the differences between the CDR regions. We're going to take um, Keytruda, which is this guy here, and we're going to align him to Optivio, which is that guy, but only using selected regions of the protein. So we're going to do an alignment of the heavy chains just to see <clears throat> the differences between the paratops when the antibodies are in the same frame of reference. So what we've done is we've highlighted the heavy chains of the antibodies. And the idea here is we want to navigate the antibody structure using the annotation. So we've taken the heavy chain of Keytruda and we've aligned it with the heavy chain of nivolumab. And we can now see the fact that Keytruda and nivolumab actually align very well down here. You can see that the alignment down here in the constant regions are well preserved. But when it comes to the CDR regions, but these are a lot closer than how I would have thought they would be, right? Because the, you know, the green, right, those yeah. are very similar, the orange, the red. Fantastic. Um, and it's really those, the blue and the purple, right? You know, the elongation there exactly. to really yeah. you know, dig into that. That's antigen. fantastic. You, you've yeah. actually got the, the this is, this is the, the trick of antibodies. So with antibodies, there are certain parts of the, of the uh, variable domains that mutate more than others. So each region is mutating or maturing in the presence of the antigen. So what happened was when, when uh, the mouse was immunized with PD-1 to generate Keytruda, it generated this heavy chain here, which is a bit longer. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yep. And if we just hide Optivio, you can see that in Keytruda, this is a heavy chain. And it also... Uh, sorry, CDI heavy chain three, which is which is a bit longer, and if we bring back Tivio, you can see that the heavy chain is much smaller. 
this is an indication, even when you're looking at the antibody, before you even uh, get to the point of, we know that it's going to bind to different epitopes because the, the variable regions are so different. And yet the antibody structure itself is similar. But within Nanome, now we immediately, and I know, Steve, you've been working in Nanome for a long time, but at Nanome, we haven't been putting a lot of biologics into this space, but you immediately identified the differences between these particular uh, chains without yeah, anyone having to told you. It's pretty obvious. What's going yeah. on, yeah, you just see it. So you just see it. In fact, if we had a repertoire of antibody sequences that we knew bound to PD-1, and we wanted to compare it with this, we could generate homology models and just make sure that we select different heavy chain constant region threes and different heavy uh, light chain constant region one. That will give us antibodies that are binding to slightly different epitopes on PD-1. We've started generating tools that are gonna enable scientists to navigate the homology models of their antibodies to understand which bits of the antibodies might be useful for binding and which ones might not. For instance, if Keytruda was binding in a slightly different um, place, it would be obvious for them. But if imagine if you had antibodies that are binding to the same epitope, but they've got different affinities, you could look for um, CDRs that you could graft into the same constant region and generate new antibodies. So I just thought we should share this today to show you the differences between Keytruda paratops in the absence of the epitope. And then the consequence of that is if we go back to the epitopes and if we can now, we're going to, rather than align by the, by the uh, antibodies, we're going to align by the PD-1 so we can see where the paratops intersect between Optivo and, <clears throat> and, and Keytruda. The first thing we, we notice is that Keytruda, which is this guy on this, on this left-hand side, is actually binding in a completely different epitope with this purple region here, which is the heavy chain three from uh, CDI heavy chain three, this paratop bearing itself into the, an, an, into the antigen. However, when you look at the heavy chain of, of Optivio, it actually binds to this side of the antigen. So you can see, although the constant regions are very similar to each other, their epitopes are completely different. One is on this side of the antibody, uh, of, of the antigen, uh, of the target, and the other one is on that side of the target. And so you can see our suspicions that these antibodies were probably sampling different epitopes is correct because we know that the machinery for recognizing the antigen is very different. In fact, the sequences as well as the length of these heavy chains are different, especially when it comes to the CDR regions. And so lo looking at these two structures in Nanome, you automatically, first of all, recognize that there are differences before you even see the antigen. And then in the final analysis, when you look at the antigen and you actually look at where on the antigen they bind, you see they're binding in completely different epitopes. So these epitopes suggest to me that Optivio, which is on that side, and Keytruda could actually bind on the same protein together. Okay, there's some places where they might interfere with each other, but when you look at the two epitopes, it looks like the epitopes are completely separate. We haven't got an antibody that binds to this surface, but maybe in the future we might have somebody else generate a competitor antibody that is going to sample this area of the of the antigen. Or, or so you know, remember, kind of cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm getting ideas just as we're in our, our science session, but um, you know, because right now we're looking mostly at like these these big heavy chain interactions here, right? Mm -hmm. um but yeah. you know maybe there, there's a way to like just keep the uh you know the three heavy chains over here i guess we'd, we'd be losing out on the blue but then to make our light chain essentially um like the heavy chain over here so we just make our our light chain have the same epitope as these three heavy chains and so we have 
like a hybrid where it's basically the orange, red, and purple targeting this area, and then the orange, red, and purple targeting this area. Um, yeah, well, we miss out interest- on, the, on the green and the blue and the blue, but yeah, we like you were yeah. saying, right? We attack both sides of the uh, of the antigen. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, people have talked about having kind of similar similar kind of uh, experiments where you take you graft one loop from one antibody and try and uh, inherit it on another antibody. The only problem we might have with that is because if, if the proteins themselves are not compatible, i.e., if these two chains, because antibodies usually have this heavy and light chains that work together, if those mm-hmm. two chains are too different, then you are going to be fighting not necessarily with, hey, we just want these two. What would have been perfect is if they had a part of the epitope that they shared and you, these things were aligning, then you could just graft one to the other. But when you're kind of coming from one epitope, which is somewhere out there, and then trying to graft that into another epitope, we might find that we create an antibody that has got um, conflicts. But, yeah. I mean, just looking at it already, it starts giving you ideas about how you could design antibodies in the future. I mean, Steve, can we put a surface on just uh, the antigen itself? And we can just have a look in terms of the surface and where these two antibodies are interacting. Yeah, you can see the differences mm-hmm. between the, this is the epitope of, uh, of uh, Nivalumab and that's the epitope of Keytruda. You can see the complete different uh, sampling of the space of the antigen that they're doing, right? As you can see, as we were saying, the heavy chain of Keytruda really plays a significant role the interaction and when we did the ali- alignment of the two heavy chains you now know why that one is much longer than the heavy chain from from Nivellum up because Nivellum up heavy chain is not really doing a lot of interaction so as this antibody matured it seems to have you know developed a much better tighter binding with that heavy chain but, but where this doesn't have a tight binding with heavy chain it seems to be complementing it by introducing better binding with CDR H1, and also it has got real good interactions between the light chain and the light chain from CDR1 here, which seems to bind much better. So you can see the two antibodies are doing something different. They're, it's, it's a relatively small epitope if you're looking at the, the relationship between the antibody and the epitope but they have sampled different regions of space. So that's the beauty of nature. Nature, you can immunize two two mice. They'll react differently to your immunization by generating antibodies to the same target that are targeting different places of the the protein. And that could have functional effects. And this, the functional effect of Keytruda and Navalumab have had a real big impact on how we treat cancer. Um, but yeah, no, this has been a really, really great session. I hope uh, everyone at home has enjoyed learning about Keytruda and um, you know, some of the structures that we've been presenting here today. Um, yeah, any uh, closing remarks you want to you wanna say? Yeah, so maybe in the future what's going to be happening is antibody drug discovery is going to be structure-driven, and the structure is going to p- play a much more important role than in the past where you would immunize the mouse and then just drive it by the sequences that bound. You know, looking at these two structures means that rational design can start coming into play. I mean, people like me who are not experts in the area of, of antibody storage design can really see the differences and even the things that we could have taken advantage of if you were designing a new truth. So yeah, I hope that everybody will enjoy playing around with these structures in Nanome. And you'll be, you know, you'll be informed about how new generation of antibodies are going to arise. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Cheeto, for joining us. And thanks, everyone at home. And we'll see you in the Science Metaverse.